All right, so we uh, left off last week. We did the uh, Gloria and Excelsis, right? And then right after that comes the salutation. And uh, I hinted to you as to what the salutation is, right? Salutation, salute, right? Yeah, like in church, the way I do it is, got my hands out. Right, we did this in catechism, that's right. Isn't that interesting? We talk about the same things in both places. All right, so you've got a paragraph there. I don't know if you've already read it, um, but I'll just read it. After we sing the glory in Excelsis, the minister says to us, the Lord be with you, and you respond, and with your spirit. Ah, look at that. Yeah. Um, there's not a qualitative difference between the two responses, but they don't obviously mean the same thing on the, on the surface. But in effect, you're doing the same thing. All right, so we'll, we'll, we can talk about that more. Uh, what, is, what does salutation mean? Salutation means greeting. Another, well, salut, right? In, in that uh, Italian, right? Don't they do that when they toast each other? Salute. Yeah, salute. Yeah, there you go. Means greeting. We see the word salute or salutation because that's how soldiers greet one another. Ah, all right. Um, salutation is like another word we say, salutary, which you hear in the, yep, in the prop. Preface, it is meet, right, and salutary. Good, right, and salutary, if you prefer. And then we thank the Lord for, his, for the salutary gifts of communion. What does this mean? Salutary, salutation, and salute all mean health, or be healthy, or healthy. All right, so, l'chaim. Oh, that's Hebrew, sorry. <laughs> well, you know that one because you saw, like, Fiddler on the Roof, right? Okay, good. So when the pastor greets us, he is basically saying, may you be healthy, well, and saved. That's all loaded up in that word. Uh, what are the words of the salutation? They are, the Lord be with you. This was a common greeting in the Bible. In fact, we still greet one another this way. When we say goodbye, this is shortened way of saying God be with you. Did you know that? Uh-uh. Years ago, people would say God be with, y- with ye, which was shortened to God be we ye which is finally got all much together because it became God be we, that is God, goodbye. All right, I like that. Um, another one is uh, good speed, which is God's speed, right? right. What's, a, what's another one we short? Holy day gets shortened to holiday, right? I'm trying to think of some others. Yeah, good and God a lot of times get transposed, right? So, all right. Oh, like gospel, right? Which is God's spell, Gospel is God's spell, spell meaning words, right? Spoken words. Not, not as in magic. All right, so let's look at one. Uh, we have Judges 18, and I'll scroll down to that. All right, so this is, what's going on here? Uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Uh-oh. The tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. All right, so then there's all, they're going to go to the house of Micah, right? And Micah, and then uh, he, the messenger, says, the young Levite, thus and so Micah did for me, he has hired me and I have become his priest. So they said to him, please inquire of God that we may know whether the, the, the journey on which we will go, or we go, will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, go in peace, the presence of the Lord be with you on your way. And the five departed, right? So the priest, this Levite, who worked for Micah, who was the prophet, what does he say? Go in peace. Ooh, we, we do that too. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way, right? So what's the gift or the benefit with the greeting here? What specific benefits attached to the greeting? Yeah, the presence of the Lord. You see that? I, I'm not making it as big. That way, what I see is the same thing you see. I'm not sure you see it on the screen. All right. Yeah. The presence with you on your way. I could probably make this a little. Can I? Have I done this before? Tried to make it bigger? Yeah. All right. It's as big as it goes. Fine. Good. All right. Make sense? Presence of the Lord, right? That would not just, that would not be the, uh, the uh, terrifying presence of the Lord. You know, like, whoa, it's me, a sinner, a man of unclean lips, right? You're going to strike me down dead. And so the Lord is this. 
the gracious, mercy, merciful, loving presence of the Lord, right? Yeah, not the one they were terrified of. The nice one. The nice one. Thanks, Leah. <laughs> well said, the nice one. All right, uh, Ruth. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. I don't know, why don't we name kids Boaz? Such a great name. You just call him Bo for short. <laughs> Have another baby. Have another baby. <laughs> huh. Uh, huh. Huh. Okay. So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, and lean after him in sight I may find said to her, go, my daughter. Mm, that's interesting, right? Uh, 2 verse 4. We're not there yet. Part of the field belonging to Boaz. That's a nice setup. Oh, Bethlehem. Go figure. And said to the reapers, I mean, look at this. It's a worker to his employees. And the Lord bless you. So what's the gift there? We had the presence in Judges. And now it's, it's a blessing. Blessing. Yeah, the Lord bless you. This is um, important for Christians. We sometimes forget this. You want your employees to do well. I All right, right. This is this is why this whole let's tax the rich thing doesn't make any sense, right? Because the rich are the ones who employ you, and if you take their money and try to redistribute it, what ends up happening? It doesn't get redistributed to you. It gets redistributed to gender studies in Pakistan, right? Which, you know, yeah. All right. I'm a free market person. If you didn't already notice. All right. Minimal government intervention. Yes. Minart, I learned a new word this is minarchist. Have you ever heard of a minarchist? Minimal anarchist. Not, not full anarchy. We don't want that, probably. Give it back to her. It's fine. Better? That noise is far preferred to the other noise. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 20. All right, so this is 20 verse 13. Yeah, so Jonathan and David. Yeah, I'll scroll down here. Oh, look, there's Bethlehem again. Hmm. That's the, that city keeps coming up. So Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out into the field. And so both of them went out into the field. Then Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is witness. So this is an oath, right? When I have sounded out my father's father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is good reward, Good toward David. I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do evil, right? Who are we, who, who are we talking about? The father who would do evil? Saul, yeah. Then I will report it to you in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. All right. Yeah, so that's an interesting one, right? So what is it? There's kind of two things there. What had the Lord given to, well, it's really one thing. What had the Lord given to Saul? It's the same thing he blesses David with, right? What is that? That you go in safety, that you may go in safety. You see that right there? I don't know. And the Lord be with you, right? Yeah, God. Kind of... um, I say his fickle unfaithfulness. Yeah, he's kind of back and forth, isn't he? Mostly forth and not back. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Safety, right? So we already had, what did we have so far? We had uh, the presence, the blessing, and the safety. All right, uh, turn your sheet over. Turn the page, I should say. First Thessalonians, or no, Second Thessalonians, right? Yeah, okay. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. 
You're probably faster than me typing on my screen. So he's writing to the church. There it is. It's a benediction. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Salutation of Paul. Oh, it even calls it a salutation. Look at that. With my own hand, which is... Right? It's interesting because most places here in Second Thessalonians is this also it might be the one where he write, says where I write with big letters. <laughs> my uh, my pious opinion is that Paul torn in his flesh is that it's, he never does really completely recover his sight. Yeah, because he writes he says I write with you in big letters. Right, so. He has to re- yeah, he has to rely on his memory. He can't because he can't read the scrolls anymore. And that, that's an interesting idea. Anyway. Most people think he's like I don't know, got a wart or something, right? But it, what would it what would make his ministry work the most difficult? <laughs> Either he couldn't see or he couldn't hear, right? Yeah, because so anyway, uh, it says he wrote it with his own hand, so that's important. But what is it that what's the salutation? In his salutation, what's the Peace, yeah. peace, always in every way, which is interesting, All right? Uh, and then one more, Second or First Chronicles twenty-two. We're going to study First Chronicles a little bit here and there in the next couple weeks in our daily prayer. Um, it copies First and Second Kings, but it does so in a way that uh, is more theological, I would say. So. Okay, David David built the temple. Didn't really finish it. Where's 11? Oh, no. There it is. All right. Talking to who? Solomon. Right. Uh, we heard a lot of Solomon building. His name name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, may the Lord be with you, and may you prosper. Build the house of the Lord your God, as he said to you. All right. Well, it's more. Give you wisdom and understanding and all of that. All right. So, David's kind of farewell blessing to Solomon is what? What does it say there in verse 11? Yeah, that his work would prosper. Right? But the work that Solomon has been given to do it's not just anything. It's not like, oh, may you be wealthy and get a private jet. What kind of prospering is he talking about? Yeah, well, specifically, it's that work of, the, of building the temple um, because it benefits the people. As long as God's word was preached and taught there, it was benefited. Um, you know, I mean, this is like we talked about. I've been, I've been struggled over the years. Like, how do you confess that it's okay to spend money on the church? Because people, you know, people generally, I don't know if you've heard this, oh, you know, uh, it's much like people respond the same way that people responded to Jesus when he had the oil, you know, the alabaster flask of expensive ointment broken and poured on his head. And they're like, oh, we could have spent that and taken care of the poor. All right. And Jesus like, leave her alone. <laughs> it was done in faith, right? It's, and that, it's okay. Obviously, you want to take care of your church so that the you know ceiling doesn't fall in or the doors doors open. You know the obvious stuff, right? Um, with actually, mm, believe actually there. It ends up being a testimony or a sign or confession, even especially to little people. Uh, we had a great experience at the rail. Somebody hasn't been here for a little bit. Um, a young child and was up at the altar and, and just really excited. Jesus, you know, found Jesus there, right? Well, you, do you have to have a stained glass window of Jesus? No. We have two, <laughs> right? Or a statue or whatever. I mean, those things aren't necessary. You could become very Scandinavian. Any of you Scandinavian? You know, like Stark, like let's just have like everything made out of wood and just boring and no pictures and just, and there's something about that because none of, then you don't have anything distracting you because the opposite could be like uh, the Rococo churches, you know those? 
That's the ones where there's like little fat baby angels all over the place. And you're just like distracted by the fat baby angels. Yeah, like you're a fat baby. <laughs> just, they look just like you except with wings. It's true. <laughs> are, are you doing your wings? Is that what you're doing? All right. Object lesson right there. All right, so some, in summary, what were they? We had the presence, right? Presence comes peace and blessing and prosperity and thing was yeah safety. All right, all right. That's <laughs> that's that's pretty incredible. Now you can imagine that with a soldier and and his like governing officer, right? That person, whether it's a centurion over a century or in our case, I don't know. I don't know military ranks too well. I guess it depends on which branch you're talking about, right? But like if you were going to be, you know, the admiral or the commander, not just to tell you what to do. We always think of people like in hierarchy as it being, hierarchies are things that hold people down. <laughs> this is how uh, today people talk about patriarchies, right? The idea of a father over a household is, Oh, we have to dismantle the patriarchy. Have you heard these things? What are they talking about? Tearing down the thing which God actually has established. Yeah, which is um, mom and dad. But mom actually, as far as hierarchy, goes under dad. But it's not dad is like, you know, the evil overlord that makes... Stop shaking your head. (laughs) No, it's... Uh, the order, the hierarchy is given for blessing, right? You're not responsible for the house and for, I mean, you don't pay rent. You don't buy your own food. You don't pay for utilities, you know. You don't even lock the door. All right. You don't pay the cleaning lady. Mom. Right. Yeah, exactly. Actually, they do most of the cleaning. Um, so it's there for, it's for blessing, health, prosperity. It's the same thing. Hierarchies are not a bad thing. They're only a bad thing when they get subverted by those who are looking rather to be tyrannical, you know, to co-opt things that God has not given. Right? Um, um, that's why we talk, when we talk about, like in church, we talk about the pastor. The pastor is the servant of the congregation. Yes, I'm over you in the Lord, but I'm over you to serve you in the same way that Jesus came to serve, not to be served, right? Yeah. All right, so in the salutation, the minister says, the Lord be with you. Is God with us? Well, that's really hard since we just had Christmas, right? (laughs) Right? So we hear math. Oh, I touched the screen here. Well, we don't have to read them because I think you probably remember them if you were here at Christmas time. Or they're so familiar. But here's from Matthew. All right. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what his name means. Yeah, the Lord saves. And so this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophets, saying... Behold, the shall conceive a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And in case you didn't didn't know Hebrew, <laughs> Matthew helps you out, which is translated "God be with ye," or however it was, right? Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> God with us, right? Yeah. So uh, God, his name Emmanuel means God with us. And how is God with us? Through the baby, yeah, through Jesus Christ, right? I mean, it's not, this is not complicated, I don't think. But of course, where is Jesus? He tells us where he is. Wherever he is. What's that? Uh, well, the Father is wherever Jesus is. Jesus is wherever he puts his name. Yeah. So where does he put his name? Yeah, at your baptism, that's right. Right? And we put his name on other things, you know. 
Christian church, right? Yep. All right, I'm going to put you down. You're 20 pounds of heaviness. I think it's 20 pounds. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. All right, good. I don't think so. No. No, I, mean, I preached on that on, was it Christmas Eve? Talking about how, I think it was maybe the late service on Christmas Eve. Um, when it says there's no room for her in, or for them in the inn, that means that none of the family took them in either. Yeah, just, just completely isolated and abandoned. Well, remember, I mean, Jesus' birth is scandalous. Entirely scandalous, right? That Joseph would accept her and not divorce her. And, you know, that brought great scandal upon his family. He was probably disowned, would be my guess. Because we never meet any of his family. Um, and then, uh, you know, Jesus, even in his own ministry, they're like, yeah, are you the son of Joseph? Right? And then anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, he has that, they, they treat him as, well, I mean, just the way John says, he came to his own and his own did not know him. Right? Meaning they, didn't, they weren't intimate with him. They didn't stay with him. They didn't talk to him. Um, some of his siblings seem to come around later on, like James. Uh, but J- James, the bishop of Jerusalem, his brother doesn't, so younger brother, doesn't believe, doesn't believe in him until after his ascension. Yeah. Um, although, um, he does seem to be received, we'll hear this next Sunday, at the wedding at Cana, which is, um, you know, that's in the region of Galilee, that's near Capernaum and Nazareth, it's in that general vicinity, and it's a family wedding. That's the only reason why Mary would ask Jesus for more wine, because she's somehow intimately connected with the, stu- the steward. How does Mary find out unless she's part of the arrangements? So maybe it's for a cousin or something? Who knows, right? But it's probably a family wedding. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe not all of his family reject him. But they do eventually by the time of the cross. Yep. All right. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, did she have a midwife? I don't think so. Um, now, a lot of the pictures, no, none of the pictures of her have midwives, but uh, with Elizabeth they do. So you'll see midwives with Elizabeth. Midwives, mid, midwifery, <laughs> it's actually a word. Uh, it's a big deal in the Bible. Because think, I mean, it's the midwives that saved the, the baby boys in uh, Egypt, right? And saved Moses and the other boys. They're somehow, those are clever women. I don't know how you disguise <laughs> a nine-month pregnant woman, but they managed to do it and the birth. It doesn't tell us how often. All right, good, good question. Uh, Let's see, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, it says. Yeah, 26. No, 6. There we go. All right, so the angel Gabriel from heaven came, as the carol says. Sixth month, that would be of Elizabeth's birth, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of name was Mary and having come in the angel said to her I rejoice highly favored one the Lord is with you which I, I always love that it's because if that's not a double entendre I don't know what it is right it means two things at once it's like, it's the greeting, it's the salutation, but it's also the truth. The Lord will be with her in her womb. Yeah, beautiful, isn't that? Blessed are you among women. So there's that word blessing again, right? And favor and blessing are both there. Um, caritas, rejoice. Oh, that's Latin, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, uh, what was this story about? <laughs> that's a hard question. The angel appearing to Mary, tell her she would give birth, right? Um, Oh, and then we didn't read far enough. So she was troubled, considered what manner of greeting this was. Right? And we, I think we talked about, did I preach on this this year? I'm not sure. Um, but I've told you before, angels come talking to you. You don't usually, I know Jim heard this probably over at school. Yeah, that's where we talked about it. That um, when angels come talking to you, you usually fall your face on the ground and you uh, cower in fear. Because until the New Testament, the angels generally don't come with good news. Not always. There are a few. Like the angels spoke to Hannah, right? Sometimes you have angels coming with good news. Uh, But they're sometimes pretty fierce and terrible. I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, the obvious example is the the angel that passed over in Egypt with the 10th plague, you know, bringing death. That's not an angel you're going to... 
Yeah. But even the shepherds do this, right? They cower in fear. All right, and so the first words out of the angel's mouth is, fear not, right? I've come bearing good tidings of great joy, which will be for you and for all people. I did preach on that too. So many, so many sermons, so, much, so little time. All right. Um, notice that it's, that blessing just keep coming out of the angel's mouth in that greeting. What manner of greeting this was? The angel said to her, do not be afraid. There it is, fear not. Mary, for you have found favor with God. Does that mean that she was looking for it? No. Yeah, you have favor. It's just an old English way. Unfortunately, with some of these really familiar stories, nobody translates them differently than the King James. You can't translate Luke chapter 1. It has to be almost the same as old King James, otherwise people get mad at you. Just like Psalm 23, right? Yeah. I, I gave you a psalm in King James today, too. I don't know if you noticed that. Wait a minute, he just switched into the and It was in the sermon. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, when you learn, uh, learn something by heart, yeah. So that's the case here. You have found favor with God. It gives me a little note here. Let's see what it says. No, it just points another way. It means that God has shown favor on you, right? So to, to find doesn't mean that you sought that favor. It just means that you've received it in this case. Old English. All right, so God has shown favor. Of course, that's what he said back in 28, right? Highly favored one. Behold, what's the favor of God? You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. I've heard that before. He will be great. Same thing he said to Joseph, says to Mary. And he will be called the son of the highest, the father, right? And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That's unique. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there'll be no end. How can this be, since I do not know a man, Mary said. The angel said, answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest, that's the language of Daniel, but referring to God the Father, will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. All right. So the question there is, how would Mary give birth to the Lord God? It's that, it's that overshadowing language, right? And we didn't talk about it this year, but maybe it'll come up in a Christmas sermon some year. Right? This is the same language from Genesis 1. God hovered over the face of the, face of the deep. Right? So her womb is like the darkness and the deep. Right? And he hovers upon it and brings life into her womb. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. And we actually confess that's the job of the Holy Spirit in the Nicene Creed, right? The Lord and... No, 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 that's the first, first article. Third, third article. Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Okay. i sorry, I had to make you jump right into the middle of the creed. All right. So, all right, so this should help you out when we look at Matthew 28. You know this by heart, probably. Matthew 28. Go disciple making, as I like to translate it. Yeah. 28 verse 20, 19 and 20, it's right, I mean, 19 and 20 are in the catechism explicitly, so you have to memorize those. All, right. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, All right? In heaven and on earth, I, wrong translation. Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, <laughs> Another one you can't. And lo, who talks that way? Uh, I'll leave it that way. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. So the question is, is Jesus still with us today? Yes, but how? This is connected to the sermon. He told us. He told you right there. How? What's that? Yeah, how? What did he just, he just told you how. Let's go back a couple of verses. In baptism? Yeah. In teaching? All the things I've commanded you. Right. In your baptism, in his word, all the things he's commanded, including take, eat, take, drink. All right? Forgiving, forgiveness of sins. That's how he's with you. I know. We, for us, it ends up being kind of cliche, you know? Oh, word and sacrament, word and sacrament. Uh, that's unfortunate because it's how Jesus promised to be with us, and it's not cliche. It's actually... It's, a, it's our essential confession. 
as to um, why we gather and what we gather for. Yeah. Right, but how do you know he's with you to forgive you? Right? To be with you in his grace and mercy. Remember we talked about, there's different ways that you can approach God, right? Or be afraid, right? right. So, um, I like the one way, I had one professor kind of give me this anecdote, but it works for me, maybe it'll work for you. Um, he was having an argument with somebody who, you know those Calvinists, terrible people, just joking, just joking. <laughs> Um, but no, but the Calvinist was making the argument that, well, God, it says that Jesus is in all and through all and, you know, he's everywhere. That's, that's absolutely true. Except, um, you know, he, this was in Colorado, so he pointed out the window that you could see Mount Hood. You know Mount Hood? Is that near Boulder, I think? Is that right? Anybody been to Mount Hood? Oh, it's in Oregon. All right, so there in Oregon. I my story wrong. It's near Portland, maybe. Olympia. Anyway, so wherever it was, you could see Mount Hood out the window. <laughs> you can't see it from Colorado. <laughs> anyway, there's Mount Hood, right? And, and he says, you know, does that reveal the goodness and the grace of God, right? And the Calvinist says, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it was in the summer. It's beautiful. Look at all, you know, it's green and there's such a, He's like, okay, fine. I'm going to put you on the top of that mountain in the middle of winter. God, that you're on top of that mountain. Same thing um, that's a blessing can be also a curse, right? Water's this way. Water can give life. Water can also take away life, right? Um, what are some other examples? I mean, I gave the example, somebody was saying, well, you know, oh, they were, I was reading the, some Catholic, um, it was some bishop saying, you know, medicine is a gift from God, which, you know, medicine is a gift from God, right? He said, I made the point that, like, penicillin's a gift from God. But if I take it, it kills me. It's like, it might be a blessing to you, but I can't. I can't. I'm violently allergic to it. <laughs> you see? So, that, so the, the question is, how do we know that that, like, if you're out for a Sunday stroll in the Arctic blast, um, that it's a blessing to you, that it's good for you, that, that God is there with his grace and mercy. We don't unless we have his word attached to it, Right? So, the, like, the water of baptism saves, in particular, one, but you don't use too much and don't try to kill you with it, <laughs> but because of God's word attached to it, right? Same thing with the Lord's Supper, right? Bread and wine. I mean, even alcoholics can receive the, the communion of the Lord's Supper. Why? Because it has God's promise attached to it. He's promised not to curse you if it's received in faith. Um, that's hard for some alcoholics. You know, they might prefer a diluted cup, but still, it's not going to kill you in the way that if you go have another drink, it might, right? Um, that's not just pious superstition. That's God's word that's attached to it, you see. Same thing with, like, gluten. <laughs> we have gluten-free ones available, wafers for people, but I'm like, I don't do wheat, but um, in the sacrament, I'm just like, I'll let you, God, you're going to take care of me. I'm not going to worry about it. No. That's not just pious superstition. Again, he says, take, eat, take, drink, right? And he attaches it to bread and wine. I suppose we could use other bread, but anyway, you get the idea. So that the distinction is where has he promised? Where where has he promised to be for me in grace and mercy? Right. Um, that isn't to say you can't experience the glory of God on top of Mount Hood. You can, but you want to be cautious about not making a blanket statement that that's always true. I mean, maybe in the winter it is beautiful and glorious as well, as long as you're clothed, um, you have a means of escape. If there's an avalanche. I mean, and I suppose in the summer you could trip on a rock and fall and hit your head. So, right, exactly. Yeah, so that, that's a common trope. Um, it came, I don't know who originated the phrase, but, you know, I know Jesus. I know him, you know, because I feel him in my heart. Um, how do you know that it's not just heartburn? I, I'm being a little joking there, hopefully. Yeah, but, but what we're trying to say with that is not... If you know him in a heart, what you're saying is, I believe, I have faith, right? Um, well, how would you know you have faith? Because you feel something in your heart? No, because you listen to his word, because, because you trust in your baptism, right? You seek him where he's promised to be found, yeah. So the, so the proof of faith, that faith is living 
is not your feelings, but it's actually your actions, right? Which often correspond with your feelings. We don't want to disparage feelings, but it's not the first thing. It's usually fo- feelings follow faith. You know, they follow trust. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't want to invert things and say, well, I, f- I believe I'm a Christian, and then, but I don't need to go to church. I don't care about my baptism. I don't, Lord's Supper is just something nice to do every once in a while. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Jesus has actually said this is where he's promised to be, and you're telling me you can be a Christian without going to where he's promised to be or listening to him? Or He says, I'll be with you, but in what things? In the baptizing of his name and the teaching to observe all things. In the making of disciples, that's where he's promised to be, which is what he did for you today. You were already his disciple, I hope, follower of Jesus, right? But maybe you, were, uh, maybe you had been walking a little bit off the path, and he brought you back on, right? Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. That may be revolutionary, but I don't think so. All right. The Lord is with us. We are truly blessed. We have peace. We have health. We have salvation. We will be well. We will be is God with us? Of course he is. Here's uh, how we learned how. All right. So now he's going to go back and summarize the author here. Uh, we talked about the invocation, invoking, calling upon the Lord. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. saved. Remember that? That was a, that's a scripture quote. In absolution, the Lord forgives us. He commands his ministers to forgive the sins of his people 70 times, seven times, right? Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted them. <laughs> I don't know. That's not how we say it anymore. How do we say it now? They are forgiven them. Sorry. Uh, in the intro, it, the Lord invites us to come into his presence, right? The very blessing of the salutation is what he does for us in the intro, it, the entrance psalm which today was really particular to, of course, the theme of the sermon, um, if you remember, because it was quoted from Revelation 19, which I read to you at the end of the sermon, but also um, Isaiah chapter 6, right? And the train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, The Kyrie, the Lord teaches us to call upon him in mercy so that he may answer us. How can we ask him for mercy? Because he's promised to give us mercy, yeah. And the glory in excelsis, which we talked about uh, two weeks now, previous, we see why the Lord has mercy on us. His son is at his right hand. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to give us peace. All right. Um, Now, here's this is one. This is finally to that question that you had. You didn't have (laughs) the question I put in your in your mind, I suppose. Um, Divine service one and two. It says, "I say, the Lord be with you," and you say and also with you, right? That's a change. The old language was, and with thy, or and with your spirit. Hello, children. Can you just, yep, I see it. Just sit down. It's good. We'll look at, we'll do those at home. We just got a little bit, we want to talk about this part because we can answer this question. After the minister says, Lord be with you, Lord be with ye, we respond and with your spirit. In other words, we are hoping that the Lord would also be with, would all that. Whoa, what did I say that wrong. We are hoping that the Lord would also be with the spirit that the pastor has. Does that make sense? That's, I don't think that's what he meant. That we would have the same spirit the pastor has is, I think, what he meant. What does this mean? The spirit. What spirit are we talking about? What spirit does the pastor have? All right. Uh, pastors, when they become pastors, and then it's repeated when they're installed in a new congregation. They have a word put on them, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Some, have you ever seen uh, windows, stained glass windows maybe, with of, and then there's the seven fires around them? Have you ever seen one of those? We actually sing this in one of them. Hey, children, you're distracting the, the people. Just sit down. Just, there you go. Um, we sing this the, about the sevenfold graces to impart. Come Holy Spirit, blessed, I think is the hymn. It's a, talk about the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, it's an old tradition, but one of, you know, the Holy Spirit comes to you in many, many ways, but always through His Word. All right? So you receive the Holy Spirit in the Word of your baptism, you receive Him in the Word of absolution. One of the places that the Spirit is given is in, is in ordination. When a, pa- when a man, I should say, is set apart to be a pastor, they lay hands on him, just like we read in Acts. And the Spirit comes upon them. We saw this in Pentecost, right? The Spirit came upon them and they spoke in foreign languages. The Chaim. And uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so are you all ordained, set apart, ordered? 
um, for God's good use. Yeah, not all as pastors. You know, with, with first, all been set apart as God's priests to serve um, Him day and night in His temple through your vocations wherever He's put you. All right. To the Spirit. Uh, so, what does He say here? The salutation is called the. We remember that in his hands on the head of a man, and that man, pastor or bishop, will give the pastor. Usually, it's a word of scripture, a blessing, right? Yeah. Um, it used to be until the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was founded here in uh, in America that all of our pastors had uh, could actually trace their ordination ap- through the apostolic order all the way back to one of the apostles. Yeah. Uh, and then when we came to America and the bishop uh, was accused of an affair and he was removed from office, the, <laughs> the first bishop, the guy who was supposed to like start the church in Saxony, church in uh, Perry County, Missouri, with these young women, like three women or something on the boat on the way over. It's pretty easy to make that accusation since he left his wife and kids behind in Germany. But uh, his family to this day say that it was a false accusation. Who knows, right? I mean, Germans can be kind of nasty people sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, actually, everybody can. CFW Walter, who ended up being our first president, was a young pastor. And the question was, um, Bishop to make right? You shrug your shoulder. Um, pastors or named pastors. But where does office come from? Does it come from a It comes from Jesus. The eventual answer, um, we have a book, it's called Kirka and Amt. ordains pastors. And And then the pastors there doesn't need to be an unbroken back to Jesus and the apostles. Area. So their pastors could claim apostolic succession. All right. um, we don't call them bishops, but they kind of act like bishops anyway. Yeah, you can't really out order. But we we adopted different names because I think we were trying to avoid some of the um, what do you want to say baggage Bad with it. baggage. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so we chose presidents, yeah. Presidents. So we have, and then we have circuits, and but it's basically dioceses, bishops, archbishops. I mean, we have the same thing. They don't have the same authority necessarily as like in the Roman system. Um, we could give them more authority. Sometimes congregations do, right? So that they say bishop, you know, or actually the English district calls their their president. A bit bishop, actually, of the Missouri Senate. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we'll ask him to come in and say, "Look, we can't figure out what to do. Just tell us what to do." Yeah, but fair enough. You can get, you can confer that authority to him if you want. He can guide you. I, any, like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Listen to her. Correct. In the Eastern Church. Let me listen to Christian History Almanac, which is produced. It's
whatever calendar. I don't know. Uh, all right, so I'm just going to summarize. The kids are, you know how the kids are. So um, you can look these up on your own, but I'll tell you a little bit. Let's see. So 1 Timothy 1, the spirit that's given there is, by Paul to Timothy is the spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. Power, love, and sound mind. All right. What should Timothy give attention to so that he does not neglect the gift that was given to him? Right? Same thing that, sit down, Esther, you're distracting. Um, the same thing, be attentive to, which is to reading God's word, right? Exhorting, that is teaching, or, excuse, yeah, teaching. It's more than teaching, it's what, what do we confess, you know? The creeds, um, the six chief parts of the catechism, however you want to put that. Then John 20, what is given with the Holy Spirit by Jesus in this passage, right? That's the and the forgiveness of sins. No, John 20, because that's in, that's in the office of the keys in the catechism. You learn that by heart. Can you sit down, please? Thank you. All right, and then Matthew 10, verse 40. Uh, you probably know this. Who are you receiving when you receive the one whom Jesus sent? Esther. Yeah, all three. So whoever receives me receives him who sent me, right? Jesus says. Yeah. Um, so he, th- I mean, this is a hard thing to get your head around, I suppose, because your pastor is not Jesus. <laughs> but as, uh, insofar as your pastor preaches and teaches Jesus' word, you're receiving Jesus himself, right? And hopefully that's most of the time, unless you get me talking about, I don't know, monetary policy or something which I was doing after church, unfortunately. I didn't bring it up. All right, they're done. So, let's close with prayer. Hold on. Heavenly Father, you sent your son Jesus on this earth to give us peace, health, well-being, safety, prosperity. Uh, We ask that you would grant those gifts to your church uh, by way of your word and sacraments, um, that we would live uh, with peace in one another, uh, live in the health and safety of the forgiveness of sins, and trust that when you come again, you will receive us into your kingdom. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Salute. God be with ye. Goodbye.